Why is our rocket puffing? And why does it seem like it's taking so long to get off the rail? And did we actually start a bushfire in California? I'm Josiah, and I'm the chief engineer at Astra. And today, we're going to do an in-depth analysis of our most recent launch of Phoenix, which took place a few months ago in America. We had some very specific goals going into this launch. Specifically, number one, to reach an altitude of 9 kilometers. And number two, to fully recover the vehicle back to the ground. Desirably in a reflyable condition. But were we successful in actually achieving these goals? Well, the short answer is no. But obviously, the devil is in the details, and if you don't actually analyze what went wrong, then you'll never learn. So I invite you here today to learn along with us as we analyze what happened with our Phoenix launch. <laughs> Of course, the first question that everyone is interested in knowing is how high did Phoenix actually fly? Did we reach that 9 kilometer target? Answering how high Phoenix actually flew ended up being a little more tricky than we were expecting. Unfortunately, all of our sensor data that would have told us exactly how high Phoenix flew was destroyed in our crash landing. So in classic Astra fashion, we had to resort to some more clever methods to figure out how high Phoenix actually went. While well, we didn't have any actual sensor data from an acceleration sensor, or a barometer, or a GPS to tell us exactly how high Phoenix went, we did have a lot of camera data. And many of those cameras pointed at the rocket were also equipped with a microphone, which gives us also audio data. And this is where our first hack for finding out the altitude comes into play. There are two basic phases of flight during any rocket launch. There's the thrust phase in which the engine is on and the vehicle is experiencing acceleration because of the thrust that the engine produces. And then there's the coast phase in which the engine is off and the vehicle essentially coasts up to the apogee only experiencing aerodynamic and gravity forces. From a physics perspective, if you know how high and how fast the rocket was moving when the engine cuts out, then you can theoretically project the apogee that the vehicle will reach, assuming that you know what the aerodynamics of the vehicle are. And one clever way that you can figure out exactly how high Phoenix was when the engine went out is by correlating the visual data of when we see the engine go out and the audio data of when we hear the engine go out. Light and sound obviously travel at different speeds, so we can tell how far away that event is by looking at the delta in time between the reception of those two events. And that will tell us exactly how far away Phoenix was from the observer. Right here, you can see the light of the engine go out, and if you listen carefully, in 8 seconds, you'll hear the sound of the engine go out. This gives us a delta of time of 1.5 seconds, which equates to a distance of roughly 500 meters away from us, the observers. But the distance from the ground was only half of what we needed to know. We also needed to know how fast the vehicle was traveling. Luckily, we had many cameras which were looking at the rocket as it exited the rail. And after doing a frame-by-frame -frame analysis, we were able to figure out what the acceleration of the rocket was, which we could then project over the time in which the engine was running. In the end, this gives us a final velocity of roughly 170 meters per second, plus or minus 10 meters per second. And then, it's just a matter of putting in those initial parameters of a 500 meter altitude and 170 meters per second, and then just letting the physics project across time. This gives us a final altitude of roughly 1.5 kilometers. So, not quite the 9 kilometers that we were looking for. As you may know, rockets are not cheap, and certainly not the ones that Astra has the aspirations of building. And this is where you might be able to support us. We've recently just started the Ko-Fi as a way that some people might be able to support our project while also enabling us to give something back to our community. There are a few different levels of support which you could become a part of, and these offer benefits that range from just being part of our Discord and maybe having access to some early released footage, all the way to getting some exclusive access to some custom merchandise. And one other cool thing that's available on the Ko-Fi is the posters from our last propulsion test campaign. So if you're like me and you like decorating your walls with rocket stuff, definitely don't pass this up. But that's enough of me. Back to the video. <laughs> Thank you. 
If you remember back to our propulsion testing, then you'll know that our engine was designed to produce 6 kilonewtons of thrust. With a total vehicle mass of roughly 70 kilograms, this equates to 8 g's of acceleration. However, in that frame-by-frame -frame analysis that we did of Phoenix on the launch rail, we noticed that we were only seeing about 3 to 4 g's of acceleration, which would equate to only 3 kilonewtons of thrust. So why are we getting only half the thrust we expect? Well, this actually may be the easiest mystery to solve. If you watched our launch video, then you'll know that we didn't receive delivery of one of our packages in America. That package just happened to contain our entire ground system and also our fins. So we had to rebuild all of these pieces in a single day just before the launch. And fortunately, this resulted in a few compromises that we had to make in terms of engine performance in order to have a launch. First of all, our improvised ground station had no way to read pressure sensors which were on the vehicle, which essentially made those sensors useless. The consequence of this being that we would have to somehow fill Phoenix without a pressure sensor. Time to do some sketchy shit. Do da do da. Hope I get away with it. Oh da do da day. But don't worry, we're not crazy. We still put a pressure relief valve onto the filling line so that we couldn't overpressurize our tank. However, that pressure relief valve has a trigger pressure of 65 bar, which is 5 bar below our operational pressure for the tank. In addition to pressurizing Phoenix to 5 bar less than its operational pressure, we also had to make other compromises in the design of Phoenix because of the box that was missing. We were also unable to fill Phoenix 100% full. The reason for this was a combination of high temperatures at the launch site, smaller bottles in America than the ones we're used to in Germany, and also just generally not having enough information to know exactly where the fill level was before the launch. In the end, we probably only loaded about 12 to 13 kilograms of nitrous oxide into the tank, but Phoenix is supposed to fly with 18. But it wasn't just the filling of Phoenix that was affected by us not having this box, it was also the fact that we didn't have our rocket fins. This required us to go manufacture much heavier fins made out of steel on site. In the end, we added about 4 kilograms of total mass to the vehicle, which obviously had a big impact on the acceleration that the vehicle could achieve. When you put all these effects together, you end up with a vehicle that has about half the acceleration that you were expecting in the launch, and also, due to the shallower fill level, a much shorter burn. So the lesson here is fairly simple. You just have to make sure that when you're dealing with hybrid systems, you take ground systems very seriously. Every compromise will cost you something. Besides our obvious engine performance issues with the rocket due to our filling station not being available, there was also another anomaly that occurred during the launch. More exactly, why is our rocket making these strange white puffs of smoke? As the vehicle ascends off the launch rail, you will see two instances in which a white plume of smoke emerges from our engine nozzle. This led us to think that something was getting dislodged while we were flying, and part of the combustion chamber was being ejected out of the nozzle. But after carefully checking the combustion chamber, we didn't notice any out-of-place lining or insulation, so that didn't seem to be the culprit. In order to perform proper due diligence, we also investigated the footage of our engine test data, and it turns out that we also found these puffs during the engine testing. And interestingly enough, there was always two of them, just like at the launch. We used D3P solid motors to ignite our engine, and coincidentally, we just so happened to use two of these igniters. Coincidence? I think not! So what's most likely happening here is that each of those puffs is corresponding to when one of those igniters gets ejected out of the nozzle. Unfortunately, our recovery system didn't work. But why it didn't work is actually quite interesting. The nose cone was ejected and the parachutes did come out, but the issue was with the timing. Unfortunately, the nose cone was ejected much too early into the flight, while the vehicle was still moving at 140 meters per second. That of course put insane forces on our drogue parachute, and basically just ripped it right out of the vehicle. At that point, Phoenix was basically crash landing. But the real question is, why did our nose cone come off so early? If you've seen our recovery video, then you'll know that we deploy our nose cone by using a compressed gas cylinder which is opened during flight. This action pushes the nose cone off the vehicle, which also pulls out our drogue parachute. However, in order to make this work, we need to make sure that the internal volume of the recovery bay is pressurized. 
Otherwise, gas that gets released by the canister would just leak and not actually blow the nose cone off. And it was this fact that caused us to overlook a very important variable. When we do our testing on the ground, we don't really have problems because when we have a pressurized recovery bay, there's an equal amount of pressure at the start on the inside as there is on the outside. But of course, this recovery system can't just work on ground level. It also needs to work while it's flying. And as Phoenix ascends into the heavens, the ambient pressure actually starts dropping because as you go higher up in the atmosphere, the pressure goes down. And this causes there to be a pressure difference between the inside of the recovery bay and the outside of the recovery bay. And when there's a difference in pressure that acts on a surface, then there is a force. And that force is specifically trying to push our nose cone off. This isn't such a big problem at the start of the launch, when that pressure difference is not so big, and the vehicle is also experiencing lots of g-forces and aerodynamic forces which are holding that nose cone in place. And those forces of acceleration and aerodynamics are going to be bigger than the force caused by the difference in pressures between the inside and the outside of the recovery bay. So at the start, the nose cone will stay on. But of course, once the engine cuts out, all of a sudden those acceleration forces are going to be gone, and the aerodynamic forces are going to be slowly going down, but you're still ascending into the sky, therefore the difference in pressure is still increasing and increasing and increasing. So there's a point at which there's a crossover between when the difference in pressure between the recovery bay and the ambient environment creates a bigger force than the aerodynamic forces that are holding the nose cone on. This theory was proposed, and so we ran a quick analysis to see exactly when we would expect the nose cone to come off, if this was true. Our model predicted that the nose cone would come off in this situation after about 8 to 9 seconds, and it just so happens that that is precisely when the nose cone came off, so we're pretty sure that this is what caused our premature nose cone ejection. The fix for this is fairly simple. We just need to design a locking mechanism which keeps the nose cone on while these pressure differences are acting on the nose cone. Of course, you would release that locking mechanism once your rocket reaches apogee, and the nose cone can be deployed with the pressure as it's supposed to be. With a failed recovery system and only gravity acting on the system, there was only one place that our rocket was ending up, and that was, of course, the ground. And with the energy of ballistics being what they are, that impact was quite severe. Our tank immediately exploded on impact, blowing high concentrated oxidizer all over the brush of the surrounding area. When you combine that with the heat that was still existent at the nozzle, it's the perfect variables for a fire. So yes, we did start a bushfire in California. But despite this unfortunate ending, the team learned lots of important things which are going to allow us to make the next rocket launch that much better. So we hope that you don't make our mistakes as well. And we hope to see you in the future with some more successful vehicles. And remember, to expand your horizons. <laughs>